Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. Today's guest is Lauren Hubert. Lauren is the registered dietitian and weight loss expert behind the brand, The Sorority Nutritionist, where she helps women learn how to eat for sustainable fat loss. In a world where fad diets and contradicting information on the internet is always making us believe we need to be restrictive and miserable to lose weight, the sorority nutritionist is disrupting the weight loss space by teaching women how to eat and approach weight loss with a simple, flexible, and actually enjoyable approach. In today's episode, we talk about why you don't need to go low carb to lose weight, why most people underestimate how much they actually eat, how to build healthy eating habits that last, how to prevent self-sabotage after messing up on your diet how to effectively track your progress, non-negotiables for weight loss, and so much more. So let's get this conversation going and welcome Lauren Hubert to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Lauren, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. This will be a party. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. And speaking of fun, I think a good place for us to start is I know you work with a lot of people helping them to improve their health, their nutrition, their relationship with food. But what I'd like to know is like, what are like three common myths that you're commonly debunking with your clients? Oh, yeah. Well, one is definitely you have to eat 1200 calories a day to lose weight. Mm. That's not that's just like some magical number we pulled on magazine covers. And I don't know. I really don't know who started this myth, but I have a big bone to pick with you because you can definitely eat more and weigh less and still be in a deficit. So that's one piece. I'd say the second one would be, oh, this is a good one. Bananas and fruit make you fat. Like, I don't know who started that myth. I mean, it's the whole carb and sugar bad for you thing, but yeah, fruit is not bad for you. Most people need to eat more fruit in their diet and more color. So um, that's a big one. And then I'd say the the third one, I want to pick on exercise for a moment, but with exercise, I get so many women that are so afraid of looking like a bodybuilder if they pick up a weight more than five pounds. But I will tell you that by lifting weights, you're not going to instantly look like a bodybuilder. As a female, it's quite, you know, challenging to put on muscle. You have to be really specific. So yeah, you know, I would say you're not going to just instantly gain a ton of muscle as soon as you pick up weights. It's just, it takes a little bit more than that. Yeah, for sure. And those are definitely three myths that I, that I hear a lot. And I want to focus on like the second one in that, you know, fruit is bad for you. And I think that goes along the same lines as that carbs are bad for you. So over the course of your career, how have you convinced people that you don't need to go low carb in order to lose weight or to, to lose body fat? Giving comparisons on social media, honestly, for people who don't even like, are not even inside of my programs, I've almost like primed them. So by the time they're inside of my programs, they really, really understand this and believe and trust me. But, you know, I, I show them that you know, you could have a hundred calories worth of carbs and you can just fit that into your diet and it's not really a big deal. And so learning how to kind of fit it into your budget has really helped people. Also really being able to actually unpack what are carbs. And what I mean by that is people think carbs are a bag of potato chips, but oftentimes you look at a label and what's actually interesting about potato chips is they're actually a lot more fat than they are carbs, depending on, you know, what you're getting to. So honestly, education, like to get women to not be afraid of this or that when it comes to nutrition, you can't just tell them, you have to show them and prove it to them. And I think also dwelling on the fact like when people are so restricting carbs and like they're obsessed with it, there's also other things that they're doing in their diet that sometimes can contradict their goals and their results in the first place. So being able to educate, empower, and like show them, especially for coaches out there, like you have to show, not tell. Like you can't just tell people what to do. Like you have to show them and really thoughtfully explain why or else they're not going to buy into it in the first place. Yeah. That's it's so true. And I think at the end of the day, like once you're able to zoom out and like explain to people like what carbs actually are and how they're not just potato chips, how they're in many ways like full of fiber, how they're very useful and how they can be a very like healthy component of a dietary pattern, whether that is if your goal is longevity, weight loss, weight gain, whatever it is, I just think people tend to open their eyes and say, oh, like I've truly been misled and, and now it's time to start incorporating these into my diet. I want to go back actually to the first point you made as well, because this is something that I hear a lot. I mean, I've been a trainer now for almost 12 years. And one of the things that people will say when they're trying to lose weight is they're like, well, I'm not really eating much. You know, I'm eating this for breakfast. I'm having this for dinner. I'm having that for lunch. I'm having these snacks. And when they're describing it to me and I'm like, well, I mean, you really aren't eating that much. So is it really that in, in situations like that, have you found that people are going into starvation mode or have you found that people are miscalculating what they eat? 
I really have seen and something that I actually teach the coaches, so the dietitians myself and the dietitians that work alongside me in my programs, I always go into it where I, it's not that I think a client is lying because I never would say that to a client, sure. but it's, I really go into it like until I'm working with you and I really unpack your eating habits, you might say you're not eating a lot of food and you might feel that way. But are you actually? And what I really see is once you start actually having someone log their food, really thoughtfully kind of open up and be honest about their food choices, one, they might not be eating a lot of food, but define what is a lot. Because you could be eating not big portions, but it still could be high in calories. And also what happens for a lot of women too is you might not be eating a lot of food one day, but what about the other days? What about the weekends? What about your weekly calorie averages, which is such a big thing I preach with my clients and my method. But yeah, you know, a lot of times women will think like I'm really not eating a lot and they'll really believe it and feel it. But if they're not looking at like the full big picture, what I often see is not their metabolism. In fact, I really very rarely with my clients I'd say 1%, I might say, okay, maybe you need to get your hormones tested. Maybe there is something else that's going on here that's impacting it outside of nutrition. Truthfully, for 99% of women that I work with, and I've, I've worked with thousands of women, like it's it's not your metabolism. It's the education and understanding your habits and truthfully, your consistency, like what you don't know. So yeah, you know, sometimes people think they're not eating a lot of food and it's not like I want you to just cut out more calories. I want you to actually learn what you are consuming and what needs to tweak and change, maybe what your diet needs more of so you can structure it the right way for fat loss. And I think humans now are in many ways, busier than ever. They're more distracted than ever. Their attention spans are, you know, kind of on the lower end and they want results quick. Like, how do you convince somebody to start tracking their food? Because I've gotten pushback from people where they're like, I don't have time. I don't feel like doing that, blah, blah, blah. Like, how do you address that? Yeah. Well, the thing is I can't put in this work for you. As a dietitian, I say that all the time. I cannot do this for you. I can guide you. I can coach you. I can, you know, tell you what to tweak and change, but something with my brand in particular, like you have to take accountability and I'm not just even with my brand, like anyone wanting to lose weight, like you have to take accountability for what you want to achieve. And I work with women who are booked and busy entrepreneurs have a lot going on and I get it. Like when you have three children and you're working full time, you have a different time of day and like schedule than, than a lot of people do. Right. But we're all busy. We're all booked. And whether you track your calories or not, that doesn't determine success. I actually have a saying, you don't get a gold star for tracking your calories. Like that doesn't automatically mean you're going to lose weight. It's actually about changing your habits and your eating behaviors. So, you know, I use tracking and I really frame it this way. It's to understand your eating habits. And I understand you want this to be easy for you. I want this to become easy, but you have to earn the right for food and weight loss to become easy. And it's almost like you have to go through the struggle at first and put the time and effort in to be able on the other side to, you know, have it be easy. But yeah, you know, if, if you're not willing to put in the work, it's, you know, I, I'm a no bullshit person yeah. where it's like, I, I can't put in the work for you. And tracking doesn't give you a gold star. But ultimately, if you're not willing to set time aside for these goals that are really important to you, like that's on you. Right. Yeah, you're right. I mean, tracking isn't going to give people a gold star. I mean, it's definitely going to give people hopefully some direction as to like where they're at and then like how they need to move forward. And I'm personally convinced that it's not necessarily an information problem when it comes to nutrition as far as why people aren't making changes. It's more of they just don't understand how to create these habits. They don't understand like the importance of starting slow and the importance of playing the long game and how to do that. What's your opinion on that? And then on top of that, what are some of the first few habits you get to help get your clients to do to help them like transform their relationship with food. I love that. I'm obsessed. You said the long game obsessed with that because yes, you can lose weight. I mean, I know for some people it's really hard. Of course, I'm, I very much recognize that, but sometimes it's hard too, because you're not doing the right things. And yeah, you could drastically cut your calories super low for a short period of time for the result tomorrow. But if you're doing something so short term, just for the gratification of tomorrow or next week, you could easily gain that weight back. You're not actually learning to live what I call is like a healthy and fit lifestyle. Now I always say like, you want to be fit for life. So love the long game piece to start. I, it actually is about starting small. It's literally like choose one or two things, 
strategically, it's like a domino effect, like one step at a time, like do one thing at a time. For some people, it's not even about like changing anything drastic. I honestly love when clients come to me and and they just start tracking their food. Like I want you to track one full day of eating then come back to me and then we're going to unpack what's going on here. So just you're, so, so you're like building awareness um, for other people. Maybe it's you're, you're going on a hawk or a walk, as I like to say. So it's like a 30 minute walk. Maybe you're trying for a certain number of days a week, but you, you always have to meet yourself with where you're at. And I think a big mistake a lot of women make that I'm sure that you feel the same about is they bite off too much at once, but they're also kind of like choosing things to change without intention. Like how you're changing your diet or your exercise has to be dependent on what you're struggling with. Like if you're overeating on the weekends, it's not about having more discipline during the week. Like we need to address, okay, what is a food plan for the weekend? How can we plan out your meals? How can we, you know, look at the restaurant menu ahead of time so we can plan ahead versus trying to do something because your friend Susie's doing it and that's what worked for her. Like you got to figure out what your struggle with weight loss is in the first place. Mm. I love that. You got to like, because it's truly like a, a personal thing. It's an individualized approach. Like you have to find what works for you? Like, how does somebody like begin to identify that? Because I think what happens is somebody will be like, I'm having digestive issues and they'll be like, Oh, I must be allergic to gluten. I'll just cut out gluten or I must have a, have a milk allergy. I just cut out milk. And really it's that maybe they're stressed. They're not eating enough fiber. Maybe they're not drinking enough water. Like how can somebody begin to identify like what's at the root of the reason why they're not seeing results? Yeah, I think a part of it is people want to make a change immediately when they feel uncomfortable, which I get. I mean, I I always joke, like, I wanted to see results yesterday. Like, I'm just like my clients. (laughs) And I, I feel like most people are that way. But honestly, you have to get really good at being patient. And it's not patient with the results. It's being patient at before you make a change, really looking at all the things that are going on. Part of that is education because you don't know what you don't know, right? Some people might not know, okay, this one food isn't the only thing that causes bloating. I know people like to pick on dairy, but there's, you know, maybe it's your raw vegetable consumption and you're literally eating so many cruciferous veggies and that's causing it, right? But I think a a big thing that you just hit on too is like the holistic view of nutrition and health and, and weight loss too. Like, Yes, nutrition is important, but guys, like I'm a dietitian and I'm here to say like nutrition isn't everything. Like nutrition is important, but if you're chronically stressed, your sleep is cr- you're so hard on yourself and you have just all these other things going on in your life, like you could have a kick-ass diet plan, you could have a kick-ass workout plan, but that's sh- not going to solve the problem if you have all of this other stuff going on. So you have to view your health and even weight loss holistically or else it can only take you so far and you might hit a roadblock and then be left with, okay, but what else can I change? I already made all those changes with my diet. Um, And maybe it's not your diet. Maybe it's something else. Right. I I love that. And I want to dive deeper into that. Like as your role as a dietitian and nutritionist, like what are some things that have to happen within the context of seeing how your clients are behaving or what their relationship with food's like, where you're like, all right, like I need to you know, step back a little bit and refer you to a therapist or refer you to something else to deal with like the issues outside of the nutrition itself. Yeah, I'm spoiled, especially in coaching. So many of my clients are so self-aware. And I think maybe it's like the social media place that we're in. People are becoming more self-aware. And some of my clients already like pursue therapy. And like, this is the final stage of their healing journey to not just feel good in their bodies, but to like feel like they look their best in their bodies. So on that front, I'm really spoiled. I'm not going to lie. However, something that I've integrated into my method is before we change anything about your diet, before I give you a calorie number or protein target, before we do anything, actually phase one, we have to figure out why your weight loss is a hot mess in the first place. So I actually make my clients take a quiz. And this quiz is based upon all the different types of women that I've worked with and basically why I think their weight loss is a hot mess and really what's been necessary for them to get to where they want to be. So for my clients that are gossip girls, for instance, they get in their head, they're self-sabotaging, they're so mean to their, themselves. I don't know if we're allowed to swear, but um, (laughs) we're good. Um, But I always say like those clients, they're a complete apple to themselves. Like they're so mean and so self-deprecating. So those clients, it's not, I mean, not as much of a, a diet issue. It's that they're getting in their own way. So they're, they're therefore not being consistent where for clients that are basic vegetables, 
um, those clients, that's all about getting back to basics. So they're actually overcomplicating it. So it's not a mindset issue. It's they need to slow down and just be more intentional with the changes that they're making. And, and for them, that's what gives them the success that they want. And there's a few other types. There's the party girl, there's the businesswoman, yada, yada, yada. However, that's really, really helped because it's helped these clients understand that a calorie number is not going to save you. A protein target doesn't mean, okay, boom, you hit this protein target, you're instantly sh- losing 20 pounds of fat. It allows them to just get more intentional about why they're here and honestly make meaningful change. And truthfully, for me, it also is amazing because I'm and my team, because I don't want to work with people that aren't ready to do that deep work because you're going to lose this weight, but you're not going to be able to actually keep it off because you're doing this for, I mean, I go out and say the wrong reasons. Right. And so along those lines, like I think one of the common things about anybody who diets, whether that's male, female, or whatever type of you know client that you reference, whatever type of person that they are, is that one of the main things that causes people to self-sabotage is when they're on a journey and they slip up. They eat more cake than they wanted to. They drank too much. They you know ate too much pizza, and they're like, "This is it. Like I'm a failure. I'm a piece of. Cr- I might as well just you know not do this." Or it just becomes this this negative mindset that spirals for days and days and days. Like, how do you help people not just prevent it, but how do you help people like catch themselves in the thick of it so that they can like move forward and get back on the get back on the wagon? Oh God. Doug, can I just say you asked the best questions? That's a good question. So the preventing it is through the strategy, right? And setting the expectation. And for my clients, what I think is really helpful in the nutrition space is one, focusing on habit change, but two, doing it in a way that it forces them to think about the habits. And that actually comes through progress tracking. So for my clients, we focus on weekly calorie averages. And this is just one example with like overeating. Actually, I I even wanted to do this with my clients this way to actually prevent them from realizing, okay, I overate this one meal. Oh, I'm an ass. I should just overeat the pizza now because I already screwed up my diet. I should throw in the towel. But that actually helps them realize, okay, wait, we have this weekly calorie average. Yeah, I went over this one meal or this one day. But wow, these other days of the week, they still really matter for this weekly average. So that strategy has really helped them. But you're kind of calling this like damage control. I'm thinking of like a hole in a ship and it's like the ship's starting to flood. Like how to kind of prevent that. Honestly, a mindset I really reinforced to a lot, even the people on social media that follow me is make your next meal count. And it's just, how can we stop focusing on the past as much? And then just focus on the present and the future. Because if you overeat, I know you're going to feel like your pants are tighter. You effed up. Like sometimes you overeat and it's just because of like the environment and just so many factors that can go into it. But Well, it's really great to reflect on why it happened and putting that like mental and emotional work into it. At the same time, you can't fix or change what happened in the past. Like it is what it is. So all we can do is focus on moving forward. And I really just find the most successful people, not just in nutrition, but in life, it's when you're focusing on the future and you're not dwelling on the past because you can't change the past. Right. Absolutely. I love that. Like you really have to focus on the future and just use like the past as a a way to like learn and gain some wisdom for how you're not only going to benefit yourself in the future, but also like learn like how you can do better in the present moment. And as far as like measuring success, I know in fitness, like it's easy, I guess, to like look at other metrics of success, whether you're getting stronger, whether you're like holding a certain exercise for a longer period of time, whether you're adhering by going to the gym more often. How does this work in nutrition? Because I know that deep down, like no matter what, people are driven by results and they want to see results somewhat quick. But on the other side of results is this thing called patience and playing the long game. So how do you help your clients like stay optimistic, like even when they're not necessarily seeing like these massive results at the beginning or, you know, along their journey? That's a really good point because with fitness, you can improve your mile time. You can get stronger, fitter, faster. I mean, all these different things. But yeah, I mean, nutrition, especially in the weight loss space, I mean, the number one thing is people want to lose weight, right? Right. (laughs) They want to see the the physical progress. So one, I mean, I set the expectation. Our goal, keyword goal, is to aim for half a pound to two pounds a week. And that's if we get your plan to where we want it to be. So setting that expectation that, okay, you're going to be 10 pounds down in 10 weeks. No. Like that's, that's a horrible idea. You're going to get people disappointed. They're going to get self-sabotaging. They're going to feel really bad about themselves, especially if they're not following that timeline. So setting expectations on what is realistic weekly weight loss, 
understanding that this is about tracking the trends and very similar to fitness, actually, you know, you're not going to be sure how much weight you can lift until you start doing it. Same with weight loss. You're not going to know what your weekly weight loss is like. So I like using progress tracking as a way to, okay, we're seeing how your execution is and, and what's going on with your plan. And then from there, we're making tweaks and adjustments based upon your feedback of your body and your weight loss. So going into it as it's more, it's not like this is your plan. This is it. It's, it's, we're seeing how you're doing as you're doing it. I think it's really helpful for people, but absolutely you can't just use the scale progress, photos, measurements, how your clothes fit, energy levels, digestion, and a huge category, what I call non-scale victories, which some of these kind of classify non-scale victories, but you know, even going out to dinner, going on vacation and not gaining weight or coming back only like one pound heavier because it's a fluctuation such an amazing win. Being able to go to a wedding and, you know, being able to have the slice of cake without any, with a, without a slice of guilt, um, you know, that's, that's really positive And that's a huge win too. But, you know, it, it depends on the person. And honestly, I actually make my clients set goals at the very beginning, day one, unrelated to weight loss. Like, I know you're here to lose weight. I mean, let's dig deeper. You're not here just to lose weight and be a number on the scale. You want to feel hot. You want to feel confident in your body. You want to be able to wear shorts because you've never worn shorts before for like 10 years because you're uncomfortable. So setting these other things are huge, just like with fitness. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that you said that you want to like your clients care about the way they look because that's something that sometimes can get overlooked, right? Because people are can be afraid to talk about it because it can come off as being vain. But that's the truth. Like people want to look better in, when they see themselves in the mirror. Like that's the reality of the situation. Obviously, yes, they want to feel better mentally. They want to sleep better. They want the relationships to get better, no doubt. But at the end of the day, they want to be able to look in the mirror and be like, I am seeing progress. I feel better about myself because I'm just improving my physical health. I'm improving the way I fit in my clothes and that sort of thing. And then I think with that said, I think that, people love hearing like takeaways. They're like, all right, you've talked about all this great information. Like what are some things that I can do like right now to improve my diet quality, to maybe start on a weight loss journey? Like what are a few like non-negotiables that you think that should be in everybody's like weight loss program when it comes to their nutrition? What are a few things that you think everybody should do? Absolutely. I love the word non-negotiable, by the way. I set non-negotiables for my clients all the time. So definitely protein, protein every single meal. Now your protein targets might be different than mine, might be different than Doug's, right? But like 20 to 30 grams at minimum per meal for most women when they're coming in from not knowing what to do. If you track your food, that's, you know, it could be three, four ounces of protein on your plate. Getting in protein is so important. Also, I like like setting a goal where typically my clients eat like half a plate veggies, a fourth carb, a fourth protein can be kind of like a healthy balanced quote unquote plate. But honestly, besides those portions, I think just trying to get more color on your plate, fruits, veggies, whole grains, but especially like the produce section, like trying to make your plate more colorful, getting in more variety is really awesome. And honestly, for me, what I find is really helpful. This is more of a me thing, not like everyone has to do it, but setting goals around how often you eat out, I think is really helpful. Not because I don't want you eating out and not because you have to give it up, but when you are trying to work towards an aesthetic goal and you're trying to be more mindful of your food choices, I think getting your in the kitchen is really important. You can find like quick, quick turnaround ways, like to make your timeline easier. It doesn't have to be like a one hour meal from scratch. I'm a big air fryer girly, but being able to eat more at home and setting that challenge for yourself, I think can be really helpful and, and improve your diet quality, especially if you go for a lot of like fast food options, in my opinion. That's a great tip. Cause it's also like a non-scale like victory, right? And that you're measuring like more of a habit and a behavior versus like what a number says on a scale. One of the things I wanted to ask you is what are a few common things you found your clients to eat like protein wise for breakfast? Because I feel like sometimes if somebody doesn't like to eat like, like eggs, it can become hard. I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> or if they don't like, if they don't like Greek yogurt or if they're like, we'll just do a smoothie. They're like, ah, I don't have time. Like outside oh. of those three <laughs> things, like have you found anything that works if people ha are having a hard time with protein at breakfast? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm a big egg girly and yeah, a big, yeah. big Greek yogurt girly. So I'm like, ah, oh, those are my ideas. However, of course, I have clients that like don't eat those foods. I love protein pancakes. So if you can eat eggs, like you're not allergic, but you just don't like them plain, 
get some like Kodiak pancake waffle mix. You could either buy the ones already in the frozen section or Vans waffles makes a high, um, high protein option too. But I do like the Kodiak cakes, just like plain pancake mix. You could put eggs, bonus points, you put egg whites, even more protein in there. And that's a good way to add the protein without like having plain eggs. I think everyone should have time to make a smoothie in the morning. Like it takes, it's, it takes like two minutes if you plan out your smoothie in advance. So smoothies are really great. Um, if you tolerate dairy, I love the high protein fair life shakes that you can get at like Costco, 30 grams of protein for 150 calories. So if you are on the go, you don't have time, girl, plan out some time to go get those shakes because then you're good to go. And then I would say those are my, those are my big ones for protein shakes too, like smoothies in particular, you can also add other forms of protein to it. So, you know, I like protein powder in mine, but you could, if you can tolerate yogurt that like Greek yogurt is going to be great for that. You could even put cottage cheese. I know some clients that have done that, but if you're not a dairy person, they even make high protein vegetarian based, or I guess not vegetarian based, like completely vegan yogurts. So that could be a good idea too. Mm. You brought up a good point. Like, how do you convince somebody or how do you help somebody, I guess, like force themselves to eat certain foods despite the fact that they don't like them or maybe they don't have time? I hear people all the time say, well, I don't really like vegetables or I really don't like that. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, there's a lot of things in life you don't like doing, but you have to do anyway just because like it's, you just do it, right? That is life, baby. You know, it depends on the context. And I always think back to this one client I had when I first began private practice before starting any of this. This man literally drank soda and like bread and like maybe like chicken tenders. Like it was such a limited diet. And I was like, after working with you, I can work with anyone. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness, we can make this happen. So I think it depends on what is the food you don't like, because sometimes I think people don't like things because they don't know how to make it actually taste good, where other times they don't like things because it's like an actual ick and like truly some like sardines, like you're not going to make me eat sardines. Like, I don't care who you are. It's not happening <laughs> unless you're paying me like $2 million. It's not happening. So if you genuinely aren't sure if it's an actual dislike, try to incorporate those foods you may not love as much into a meal and flavor it and make it taste really good. I'm a good example of this is if you know you don't love veggies, like making things like casseroles where you're actually going to mask the flavor with other things. Things like cauliflower rice, really easy way to do that too. And I don't want you to not have the regular rice. It's okay, we're having the rice as our carb, but then we're adding in the cauliflower rice for like the added veggie boost. And I mean, you can put that in casserole dishes with cheese and other things. Like there's, there's great ways to mask the flavor and still get the benefit. Yeah, I love that. And I think you brought up another good point with the cauliflower rice. And it's like, do you think that that sometimes people can take this too far in that they're like, all right, like cauliflower rice has more fiber. It has a lot less calories. It's more nutritious. I mean, probably than you know, rice in general. So I'm just not going to eat rice. I mean, do you see people taking it too far with their nutrition? And can that become problematic? Yes, 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 yes. Times a million. And I just view it this way. Like, you can't almost even compare rice versus cauliflower rice because they're different. They're not meant for the same thing, right? We're comparing a starch, like like a grain, to a vegetable. And there are, I mean, I put it this way, like there are pros and cons to everything. I saw a post about how blueberries have a certain chemical in it, but really all our food is chemicals, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, there's so many arguments we can make, but I am just one of those dietitians that, of course, if something is, is not as nourishing, I mean, there are foods that are more nourishing, there are foods that are less nourishing, right? But we have to eat. And if we're constantly trying to find all of the bad things in food, you're going to find so many reasons not to eat a certain food. Food. But at the end of the day, I want to live a diet where I get to eat the foods I love, a lot of abundance, and focus on what are the healthful things within my food that are so freaking cool for our bodies and our health and have more of them versus what to cut out. And honestly, I think it's a mindset thing. Like a lot of these women and men that get so focused on these specific nutrients. I honestly, I, the only thing I feel is I feel bad for them, right? Because if that's consuming your life so much, like there's no way you can feel healthy and balanced that way. Right. And I've, you know, it's important to note too. I've been that person before in college. That was me. That's what got me into nutrition. I was so focused on being restrictive and it got to the point where at first it made me feel so in control, so healthy. It was like the elitist thing, right? Like, Oh, I'm better than everyone because I've eaten healthy foods. But then it gets to this point where it's like, well, I can't even go out to a restaurant and eat what I want without being so focused on it. So 
Yeah, it can definitely be taken to the extremes. But the beautiful thing is you can make your next meal count and you can get back on the right track. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can go out to eat and still love your diet and still also love the way that you look. Thanks for sharing your journey. I know you have an amazing story with your own journey with health and nutrition. And my question is, like, have you found that based on your own experience of what you've overcome and then working with others, when people are at that point where they're now like just essentially like not hardly eating anything other than like whole foods and they've cut out pretty much anything that could be quote unquote deemed as unhealthy, like do you find at that point that it helps them have a better relationship with food by like taking a step back a little bit and having more room for moderation? Or have you found that it's like a relationship to self thing where they need to do some inner work? A little bit of both. And honestly, I know I'm a broken record, but it goes back to why they're here in the first place. I work with women who are party girls, a lot of fun. Like they need to flex the discipline muscle where I work with women like the gossip girls. Like they're so restrictive that they actually need to learn more balance so they can learn how to be consistent because their lack of flexibility is actually causing them to have this yo-yo all or nothing like binge and restrict kind of cycle. So yeah, it really depends on one, why your weight loss is a hot mess, but two, like understanding that internal work too. And I will say the internal work piece is really important for so many women that are so rigid in their thoughts. Like it doesn't matter how how many languages I will say, like you need to be eating the right amount of food and more calories, but it's so easy when you've done diets before. And like, you're, you're like, well, you know, I was low carb before and I lost 10 pounds in like two weeks by doing that. But then I'm, I follow back with, well, why are you here right now? Like that didn't work. So we have to change the verbiage around, yeah, you might've seen success short term, but I want to emphasize the short term piece because it didn't work. And that's why you're here and you're asking for help again. So it's a little bit of tough love. You have to meet people with where they're at. They have to be willing to put in the work too, right? Because I can only guide. I can only take the horse to water. You have to drink the water yourself, right? I love that expression. But yeah, a little bit of mindset. And honestly, you know, this process just takes time to be quite honest. I'm sure you see this all the time too. Like it takes time. And for some people it takes longer for it to click, but when it clicks, Oh, oh honey, it clicks. Yeah. And it's interesting. Like I think like earlier in my career, it was more, I was putting out fires in the sense where people were not wanting to eat healthier. And now I feel like the pendulum has gone so far that I'm putting out fires Completely opposite. that I'm like trying to get them to kind of dial it back a little bit, <laughs> just because like I can just see from the outside that they're driving themselves like insane by what they're doing. And with that said, like taking this to the next step, like how do you help people who are already, I mean, most people are experiencing some levels of stress, like in and going on some sort of nutrition plan when they're trying to lose weight and change their health can be stressful too. Like how do you help people make it like pretty manageable for themselves? Yeah, I think it depends on why they're getting stressed in the first place. For some women and some some people in general, honestly, I think beginning a diet plan and quote and I use diet plan like it's not like a diet, but it's, you know, having some structure that can actually alleviate stress because a lot of women are like, I'm constantly thinking about food. I'm like, well, you're constantly thinking about food because you're winging this and you don't know when your next meal is going to be, what those portions look like. And you have to make a million decisions. But when you have like some structure and more parameters, it actually makes you think less. And when you plan in advance, like you have less work to do overall. So for people really stressed and it's more like a scheduling thing, I do think, you know, it does take effort and work, of course, but it can actually streamline this. So it's easier for you. And honestly, everything comes down to problem solving. There is no freaking problem. I mean, there's some problems in the world we can't solve, but nutrition, oh yes, we can solve these problems. So honestly, if you're struggling with something and so stressed out and it's related to nutrition, like all we have to do is put our head, or I don't know the expression, but like you have to think about it. Just think about what's, what the struggle is and we can overcome it. So if it's a scheduling issue, like let's think about some quick and easy meals. If it's, I'm so stressed out about my progress, well, let's explore. Why are you stressed out about your progress? Oftentimes it's an expectation of where you're at. Is not matching the effort you think you're putting in? And so we need to unpack that. And there's nothing that will mask that besides actually addressing the problem. But you always have to get to the root problem for you to get the benefit and like not stress about it anymore. Yeah. You always got to get to the root cause of the problem and like shifting gears a little bit. I know obviously you have your master's in nutrition, your dietitian, and there's a lot of talk at times on like the schooling that nutritionists get. And sometimes people oh, will say, like, yes. Oh, this is a good topic. <laughs> what, what, what is your view on that subject? And is there anything that you've changed your mind on in the last few years? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I think I've had a really unique experience 
in my journey and path to be a dietitian because I got exposed to nutrition, not just in like the clinical dietetic setting and like people to like medical nutrition therapy stuff, but I actually got a lot of experience in sports nutrition. So I actually, some of like professors I look up to till this day, like they're actually not dietitians, but they were like sports nutrition experts that do a lot of research. So for me, it was so cool. And like, even when I hear like new research, I like geek out. I'm like, oh my goodness, this old professor, like he came out with this research. So for me, it I got really awesome experiences in the sports world that I think really impacted my views on things. However, I was at one point borderline, I felt like being bred to be more of like an eating disorder, health at every size dietitian. And I know this comes as a shock to some people, but yeah, I was really in that space. I wasn't on social media at the time, but it was something that, I mean, honestly, I feel like I could have had a really great career in it, but I just wasn't passionate about it. You know, I, the topic is really nuanced and complex, but I don't agree that BMI is both. I don't agree that, you know, intentional weight loss is inherently fat phobic and I'm a, you're a bad person if you promote weight loss. It, it That never sat right with me. And I think, you know, I really think about the women who do want to intentionally lose weight, similar to myself when I was back in college. And just because you don't have a diet that's really balanced right now doesn't mean you inherently have an eating disorder and you need this intense treatment. Like, oftentimes they're just a victim of diet culture. So I wanted to be kind of that gray area for women because there was really not a space where women could lose weight and not be labeled as like, you know, you're a bad person. And like, it was just so taboo at the time. But yeah, you know, I switched my thoughts. I still love a lot of the promotion, of course, of more inclusivity. There's a lot of weight stigma in our culture, but I have changed my thoughts on that. That was during my master's degree. And now, you know, over the past few years, I've definitely became more vocal in the weight loss space. So um, I know people usually go the opposite way. I did the opposite direction myself. (laughs) That's super interesting. And yeah, I think it's important to embrace everybody where they're at in their journey, but also not to demonize like somebody who needs to or wants to lose weight to better themselves or to better their health, right? Like I think we need to be able to have compassion for both sides. That's exactly it because it's compassion for both sides and it depends on what you're struggling with. Like not everyone needs the intuitive eating framework. Some people can get massive benefit from learning more about what's in their food. And a lot of my clients, they don't have a relationship with food. Like they just are stressed and busy and they're overworked and they need more structure. So yeah, I just think they're just in the, in the fitness space, fitness, nutrition, wellness, weight loss space, everything in between. Like, I think there just needs to be more of us all coming together and a lot less judgment. There's a lot of judgment in this space right now. There's a lot of that. And there's a lot of confusion. Like I think people can scroll through and, and read stuff and they'll say like one person telling you to eat vegan, somebody else telling you to eat carnivore, this person telling you to eat this, eat that, don't eat this, don't eat that. And people are like, I have no idea what to do. I'm just going to do nothing because none of this makes sense to me anymore. Yeah. And it's tough because some of these things are people in the same profession going after one another or going after like just completely different ideologies. But then there's also people that I'm like, you should not be talking about nutrition. Like, please shut your mouth. But it's, you know, it's a free country. You're allowed to say whatever you want. But, you know, it is, I mean, even the things with Ozempic right now going on, like there's a lot of very dangerous information. Like some of it is like, okay, yeah, this person has an opinion. It's one thing, but when it becomes more of like, I view it as a public health issue for some of these topics, when we're spreading like blatant misinformation about nutrition and just really unhealthy, dangerous things, it's not even for the young people out there. Like even I get 40, 50 year olds that see these things online and they're like, oh, you know, I should go carnivore, but you know, they're, they already have heart problems and like they're doing it all the wrong ways. I'm like, you don't have to do that. Like that's not the answer to your problem here. Yeah. So true. Right. Because I think that a lot of people that post stuff, they're like, I'm like, you've clearly never coached anybody because this isn't just, it's not realistic. And like, it's, it's just not realistic for people to go from like zero to a hundred with, with this stuff, right. As we've kind of talked about, and it's also not realistic for people to just completely flip their lives upside down and just like worship nutrition. Like it's just not going to be realistic for 99.99% of the people. And so like with that said, like how do you help people not just focus on like weight loss, but also longevity? Because I feel like that's also an important goal for people. 
Yeah. So it's funny. In 2021 or 2022, I, not that like me changing this means everything, but I changed the, even like the tagline of my brand to, you don't have to choose between hot and healthy. And I strategically did that because of course, all these women were coming to me wanting to look hot. They wanted to look a certain way, but I've just infused it so much into how I talk about weight loss, where you can't talk about weight loss in my opinion, and you shouldn't without talking about the health piece, because you can do so many different things to lose weight, but not all of them are created equal. And Honestly, so much of why they're not created equal comes down to the health piece of it. I mean, honestly, so much of, I mean, weight loss and body composition change, like, like the health piece honestly trumps even the weight loss piece, because if you're not healthy, like good luck losing weight, that's really going to be a difficult path for you. So yeah, you know, I think it's people like me and you from the get go, when we're talking about aesthetic goals, we have to bring in the health piece. And I think also being really blunt around the dangers of when you do things the wrong way and just having open conversations about it. But I will say it is so beautiful to see so many young women that I work with, like actually care about the health piece sometimes because maybe they're going through a medical problem, but it's beautiful to see like my clients are so mature, even if they're really young sometimes. And they're like, you know, I want to think about when I have kids and like what that means for me. And I I think there's just a big push in our, in our health and and social media to care about our health. But yeah, especially with weight loss, I think it is important to remind people as they're losing weight, really, really why you're doing this in the first place. hundred percent. Because I remember a time in my life where I was just so addicted to the way I looked and vanity and making sure I had like a certain percentage of body fat and that I had like 12 abs showing and everything that I remember like I went on like a an old school like bodybuilding diet with zero fat like zero I remember I just as w- what I knew from nutrition and what I knew just from a health perspective I knew there was something off and I remember texting one of my like friends who was a nutritionist being like hey like is this healthy and she was like from a health perspective no from a physique p- perspective <laughs> you're gonna get you'll get ripped Oh my goodness. <laughs> and she's like, so it's up to you. And I was like, I'm going to get ripped. Like, cause I was, I figured I was young enough that it didn't matter, but I remember just feeling like garbage so much. And I just remember being like, man, this just is not sustainable for me. Like, I don't know how anybody like can do this long term. And that was like one of the stepping stones, not the final, but one of them that helped me like kind of shift my perspective personally for all of this, because obviously I would never tell my clients to do that. Right. I would never advocate for that at all. But for me, I became so addicted to the vanity component, which I think a lot of people struggle with. Like a lot of people know what is good for their health in many cases, but they're like, you know what? I see this image or I see this person. I need to look like that. Like that's what I want. Like the health maybe will come as a result of looking a certain way. I mean, do you notice that as well? Yeah. You know, I think when people just focus on the vanity, that's when they get really wrapped up in it. I've been in your shoes before. I I think that's what makes us so relatable to the people that we work with because we've been there. We get it. But I also, I use myself as a cautionary tale and I always say, I'm not my lowest weight. I was at my lowest weight in college. And guess what? I hated my body. I wasn't as confident. I, you know, also like you can't think straight when like you're that low of a body fat percentage. And so just like we harp on the quote unquote dangers, the struggles that could happen when you're obese or struggling with obesity and being overweight. I also kind of like to highlight, you know, also I will not coach you if you want to be an unhealthy BMI, that's too low, a body fat percentage, that's too low. And I think honestly coaches, that's why in the coaching space, it's so important to know who you're working with and hopefully that you can trust them because you need to call your clients out if what they're going for is, is, I don't even use the word unhealthy, but unrealistic. Like you need to get really clear on what your goals are. And I think a lot of times what can happen for people like us is, okay, we begin this journey. It was with good intentions to look hot, feel healthy, do all the right things. But then you get greedy with your progress. You see a little bit, you take an inch, but now you're taking a mile. So you have to kind of bring it back to like, why are you here in the first place? And it's okay if your goals adapt and change over time. Sometimes you don't know the amount of success your body could see. You don't know how much muscle you could gain and how you know lean you could get. But we always need someone to kind of be back there dialing it in. And this is such a weird analogy, but I think about like with like celebrities and bringing people like back down to earth. And like, there's always those few celebrities that always kind of stay like super down to earth and 
like they're like normal people. But then you always see some, a lot of them are like the fame gets them and you see all those stories written about them. I feel like our jobs as coaches is like to bring our clients kind of back down to earth at times and just really help them refocus on like what is actually important because there's going to be so many of like the fancy cars, the fancy mansions, like, you know, the celebrities are like that example I'm thinking of, but not everything that glitters is gold, especially when it comes to physique. You could be a really, really low body fat percentage, but you could also screw up your hormones and not get your period and then become infertile at age 30. So there's things that can happen too. Yeah. And I feel like it's so much more common though, for people to fall into that trap now and be like, I still want to look a certain way because the information is like right in front of us. Like back in the day, I mean, you maybe wouldn't see what somebody who was incredibly lean looked like, you know, unless you like read a, like a nutrition or fitness magazine, or maybe you like read a magazine where a celebrity was featured or you watch TV or something. But now it's just like with our phones, it's everywhere. And so I think it's just that much more important to be clear and direct and educational with our clients about a lot of this stuff. So that way they can, you know, not just trust us, but be able to like be on the lookout for like what's realistic for themselves and what's not. And with that said, I think that, you know, I've touched on that people are busy, people are on the run a lot. What are a few like snack ideas that you help your clients kind of put together for them either to take to work, to take to a, maybe a sporting event if they're going with their kids? Like what are some things that, that you found to be useful? Yeah. So I, I love fruit as a snack. I know that's such a basic answer, but I think fruit is such an easy snack. You can pack it on the go with you. Some fruit is literally don't even have to chop up. So pack a banana, bring an apple. Those are super easy. I love things like the, the Justin's like peanut butter packets, like the single serving peanut butter packets. Those can be really good. Trail mix is easy. I love turkey jerky instead of beef jerky for like going to be high in sodium, but a little bit less high in fat. So that can be a fun little, fun little snack to bring with you. Honestly, though, can I be real? Oh, I had Greek yogurt. I have to give Greek yogurt a shout out. That being said, with snacks, I actually am not a big snack pusher compared to maybe other dietitians. My clients eat snacks. And actually, with how I counsel and coach my clients, I'm all about, okay, let's look at how you're eating now and I'll kind of give you recommendations and tweaks and changes. So it's very, it's an ease into their lifestyle and it's more about making changes to what they're already doing and what's existing versus like me just coming in with a meal plan, coming in hot. However, I'm a big believer if we can actually cut back on snacking and actually get fuller at your meals. It's not that I don't want you to snack, but it's like, a lot of women, as you probably know, a lot of people in general, we we could graze on snacks all day, every day, and then we're not getting the, the more high quality foods in our meals. So it's not that I'm anti-snacking. I definitely love a snack myself. However, I'm not one of those people that like I, I'm pushing snacks on people because I actually think a lot of us need to snack less and our meals really need a little bit of a transformation. Yeah, it's true because snacks, you know, snacks add up, right? And people don't, sometimes yeah. they don't know that like eating like a couple handfuls of like mixed nuts or something that adds up that could be like 300 calories, right? Because I think it's like easily, I think like 20 almonds is like 180 calories or something like I forget the exact. Yeah, which is like so healthy for you. And I mean, I love nuts, like that's for great. Sure. But yeah, they add up really quickly. And I think what's really telling too, is if you do log your food, when I see a client's food log for the first time, and I'm like, okay, your, your breakfast is like 250 calories, your lunch is like 300 calories, your snacks total to 900 calories for the day, your snacks actually are more than your meals. So we need to invert this situation. And I want more calories in your meals, less calories in your snacks. Because a lot of times too, like nuts are a really healthy snack choice. But a lot of the snack options, they're less fiber, less color, less protein, especially the traditional snack than really what you would be getting in your meals. So yeah, you, you can't almost compare snacks and meals because a lot of people, the snack foods are just so much more processed and not nourishing or not as nourishing versus the meals. Mm. What are your thoughts on like organic versus non-organic? Obviously the cost of like food has gone up significantly in the past. So people I think are having a hard time. Like, do you think it's worth it to buy organic or do you think it's uh, a bit overrated? Honestly, I'm that person on social media that I'm not like, buy organic. I know people are like very passionate about it. I think if you can afford it, that can be great. There's some foods that I think are more worth it to buy in organic, you know, especially things like berries. So like you're going to be washing off a lot, some of the pesticides at home. So if you can't afford it, that's really great. I'm going to be honest though. I pick and choose what I buy organic. And I literally this week had someone message me because I post grocery hauls all the time. She's like, oh my goodness, you don't buy organic. And she was like freaking out. I'm like, do you see the cost groceries? Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I pick and choose what is worth it to me just like you need to. And so I do think there sometimes is harm in some of these social media profiles that like 
are demonizing the regular conventional version because I don't know, I'm just very conscious of the fact that not everyone can afford that luxury. But yeah, you know, things like berries, I love to buy organic, but if it's like $5 more for the berries, sometimes I'm like, screw it. I want the regular ones and I'll just wash them. (laughs) Yeah. Along the same topic, you know, as far as like demonizing like certain types of foods, like how do you help your clients like incorporate some quote unquote unhealthy things or processed foods like throughout the course of their week within moderation? Yeah. So for some clients, I do find it's helpful to set like a number of times for some people that will sabotage and blow up in your face. So don't take this advice at face value. But I do think for some people planning it in, like I had a client, I remember um, actually was reviewing some stuff this morning. She was, she lost 25 pounds, 20, 25 pounds in 90 days with me. And every single day she fit in her Yasso bar in the evening and Yasso bars are those like Greek yogurt bars. And so for her, (laughs) literally the best. Oh my God, my favorite brands for her fitting it in was actually so helpful to make her not feel guilt. She was allowing herself to eat more food. Like that really worked for her. Where with other clients, they might be having a little too much fun. So that's where you want to like dial it in and and be a little bit more intentional. And that's where I teach this idea of worth it food. So, you know, just because the food's in front of you and just because you want it doesn't mean you need to have it. So understanding what is really worth it and being intentional about, I call it like spending your calorie money. So just trying to be a little bit more mindful can be helpful. But, you know, truthfully, when you learn your like your calorie budget and you learn the concept that calories are like money, it actually makes it less scary to have those fun foods because you're like, I can just fit this in. It's really no big deal. So I do find that education piece with the calories are like money being really big. But honestly, you have to see what you eat already. So like if you're not eating a lot of fun foods, foods, you know, or let me put it this way. If you are eating a lot of fun foods, you're probably going to need to dial back in how many of them you're having potentially. But I will say cutting back can feel very restrictive. So I like to kind of view it as, okay, how often are you going to have it? But also what else is your diet missing? So then we can just make sure everything is in balance. So it's not just like I'm trying to cut something out. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And I think like staying on the topic of like the budget and track and how many calories you can eat, like with a budget, like in many ways, like, you know, how much money is coming in each month. Like most people, I would say know that unless they're in the entrepreneurial space where it can vary, but people don't really know how many calories they should be eating. I think a lot of it can be trial and error. Have you found a a method that can be effective in giving people like a, a rough estimate of where to start? Yeah. So I kind of do it in two phases. One estimation equations are very valuable and very helpful. However, they can't be the only thing because if you're just going off of that and you're not taking inventory on how you eat now, you're really selling yourself short because these are estimation equations based on large populations of data. Like they're not going to know your body, your metabolism, what that looks like. So I use estimation equations, but I also think viewing how you eat now and tracking a few days during the week, a few days on the weekend can be really helpful to kind of gauge that, that calorie number piece. But then honestly, the not fun answer that I'm sure you agree with, or hope you agree with is you just have to start, like you just have to start tracking. But what is important to note is just because you see a number on my fitness pal does not mean that is the Bible. That's the end all. That's the number that you're having. It's like, no, like you could be mislocking. So it's a little bit of trial and error. You have to see how your body's responding. You know, fine tuning how you track the accuracy, but truthfully, let the progress speak for itself. Even if you go over your budget, but you're losing a pound a week, you're on the right path. You're on a really good path. Right. I mean, it's like the analogy that I'll use is like, if you're at your home and you're trying to figure out like where you're trying to go, like a destination, like you're not going to get there by not walking. You're going to have to start walking. You're going to have to start moving like a little bit. And maybe like you end up taking a wrong turn. Maybe you end up getting a little bit lost, but you at least can just figure out where you're at and then be like, all right, well, I need to go this direction. I need to change this or change that. It's the same thing with like nutrition. Like if you don't start, you have no idea where you're at. You have no idea what you need. And what I found is that people, if they actually are meticulous about it and they just stick to tracking for some time, they can very quickly figure out like the adjustments that need to be made to make sure that they're in that, you know, that ideal, like total caloric range. Absolutely. You will not be able to make changes and adjustments to your plan if you don't start. I mean, honestly, it's funny. It sometimes takes such a big barrier for people to start, but honestly, the sooner you start, the sooner you'll have that feedback for those changes. I completely agree. Yeah. This has been an amazing conversation, Lauren, and I think people are going to get a lot of value out of this. So I wanted to thank you for coming on. And I think people are going to want to connect with you. They're going to want to find out more about your work and what you do. So where's the best place for people to learn more about you? 
Yeah. So I'm on Instagram. It's a lot of fun on TikTok as well. I am on YouTube a little bit. I'm just on too many places, I guess. I do have a podcast as well. So lots of different platforms, whatever works best for you guys. You can find me at Sorority Nutritionist on all those platforms. Awesome. I'll make sure to link that stuff in the show notes. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. We talked about so many things in the context of nutrition, between habits, between you know relationship to self, between like doing what works for you and figuring out like things that you know you need to do on a daily basis to improve your nutrition. You know, we also covered how to deal with when you slip up and your mindset around things. So whatever the takeaway was, make sure to tag Lauren and tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. We once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. We'll see you next time.